So we've seen if you have just um, a few subintervals, then the answer could depend a lot on where you choose your representative points. But if you slice finer and finer, then you should get um, more and more accurate numbers. They should converge to the actual area between that function and the x-axis. So what we want to do is to do this now instead of with some concrete or specific number of subintervals like 4, we want to do this problem with an unspec unspecific number of intervals. We'll just say we're going to do it with n intervals. Where our steps are going to be basically the same because we need to calculate the sum from i equals 1 to n. We need to sum up for each interval the value of the function at a representative point in, in the interval times the thickness of the interval. Now we can see our interval is from 0 to 2. So if you have an interval from 0 to 2, the thickness is going to be the difference between the two endpoints divided by the number of subintervals you're going to create. So 2 minus 0 is 2 over n. So each subinterval is 2 over n wide. Now what I need to do, in order to choose my representative points, first I've got to figure out where are the starting and ending points for each of the subintervals. So I know x0 is just going to be this left endpoint, which is 0. And then x1, starting from 0, if you add a space of 2 over n, you'll be at 2 over n. x2, you'll take 2 over n plus 2 over n, so you'll have 2 times 2 over n. Add another gap of 2 over n to that, you'll be at your next right endpoint, so you'll be at 3 times 2 over n. At this point, you can kind of see a pattern emerging in the endpoints of the intervals. The ith endpoint it's just going to be i steps over from 0. So you're going to have i times the step size, which in this case is 2 over n. So now we know where the endpoints of the intervals are located. Since we've calculated those, those might be a nice, a simple choice of our representative points. We'll just use the right endpoints of our, um, of our subintervals as approximations. Although, now that we know these, we could, we could find uh, what's halfway in between two, or we could use the left endpoint. But this is just a convenient representative point to choose. So I'm going to need to calculate f at each representative point. But we know that the ith representative point is going to be the right endpoint. And we know that the right endpoint is just i times 2 over n. So based on the, the, what this function does, whatever you give it, it squares it and subtracts from 4. If you give it i times 2 over n, it's going to square that, which is 4i squared over n squared, and subtract it from 4. So now I know for each subinterval what's the height of the function at the end of that interval. And now I can multiply that by the width. So I can take f of ci times delta xi. That's going to be 4 minus 4i squared over n squared. And delta xi, we know that the, the gaps are going to be even. They said here. Um, subintervals of equal length, so they're going to be all 2 over n. And uh, then what I'm going to do is add all those up from the first to the last. So I'm going to add all these up. Once I've got that figured out, then I can ask what happens as I slice finer and finer, which if the if this intervals are equally spaced, then as you um, just make more and more slices, then the norm of the partition will go to 0. The, the gap between successive points will get smaller and smaller as you um, force in more and more points because you're forcing them to have equal spacing. OK, so we're talking here about taking the sum from i equals 1 to n. If I distribute, that would be of 8 over n minus 8i squared over n cubed. We know from our rules of sums that this would be the sum from i equals 1 to n of 8 over n minus the sum from i equals 1 to n of 8i squared over n cubed. And when you look at these sums, 8 over n does not change as the index changes. It's a constant. And so we know that if you sum up a constant n times, you'll just get that constant times n. So this first sum is basically 8 over n times 8, 8 over n times n, sorry, which is basically 8. Now this one, I can pull out the 8 and the n cubed, because those don't change. And I see that what's left is the sum of the first i squares. So I have 8 minus, knowing the formula for the sum of the first i squares is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. I can, um, I can see that the answer is going to be 8 minus, let's multiply this out here, oh, this n 
cancels one of those, so we just have n squared downstairs, and we have uh, uh, 2 goes in there 3 times, and in here 4 times. So we have 4 thirds. What are the, what are the remaining terms? We have um, 2n times n would be 2n squared, and then we have an n and a 2n make 3n, and then 1 times 1 makes 1. So we have these three numbers all divided by n squared. Well, 2n squared divided by n squared would just be 2. 3n divided by n squared would be 3 over n, and 1 divided by n squared is 1 over n squared. Okay, so I figured out the sum. I used formulas that I knew for sums to get it just in terms of the end point there, the, 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 the uh, top value in the sum. And uh, now I can see uh, what the answer is going to be. And now, what do we get? We know this is only an approximation, but what do we get as we slice finer and finer? Well, if we take the limit as n tends to infinity of this, 8 minus 4 thirds times 2 plus 3 over n plus 1 over n squared, and we're going to get 8 minus, as uh, n tends to infinity, this term goes to 0, and so does 1 over n squared, because 1 divided by larger and larger numbers has to get smaller and smaller and smaller, closer and closer to 0. So we're basically left with minus 4 thirds times just 2, or that would be 8 minus 8 thirds. Or if you get a common denominator, that's 24 thirds minus 8 thirds, which is 16 thirds. We found our answer.